This morning in our study of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, our focus was mainly on Simon Peter's and John's reaction to seeing the empty tomb. We looked at what they saw, what they saw as evidence, as proof that Jesus had indeed physically risen from the dead and that he hadn't been stolen or any other sort of alternative view. This evening, our focus is on verses 11 to 18 of the same chapter, John chapter 20. And tonight we're looking at the personal experience of Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb. In the book of Proverbs, uh, wisdom is heard saying, Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. And there's something of that here in Mary's persistence in seeking diligently for the body of Christ, her loving search for it in order that she could properly take care of it. In doing that, Mary personally experiences this blessing of those who love the Lord Jesus, the greater revelation of himself that he gives to those who cling to him through their grief, through their tears. The Lord draws near to those who love him. First of all, Mary, in the story here, this narrative we're looking at, she encounters the angels, verses 11 to 13. As I said this morning, there are minor differences in the resurrection narrative that we, we, we can't be sure of. Uh, they arise out of the four gospel narratives differing slightly on what happened when for whoever was there whenever it happened. And here in verse 11, we don't know for sure when Mary arrived again at the tomb. For example, did she trail behind Peter and John as they ran to the tomb? And so while they were inside the empty tomb looking, Mary eventually arrived and remained outside of it. Verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Or did she arrive again at the tomb after they had left and gone home in verse 10? So they had gone into the tomb, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. We don't know, and we mustn't get hung up on these minor details. Remember, these minor details are what skeptics make into major details. And they do that so they can dismiss with a sort of a broad and patronizing brushstroke, that the obvious evidence for this literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ we mentioned this morning. The evidence is namely that the tomb is empty. The fact that the tomb is empty and that none of Christ's followers expected to find it that way and none of Christ's enemies can provide a body to rubbish the claims of it being a real resurrection. So here at this empty tomb, Mary is stood and she is stood evidently upset. It's interesting in verse one, all she saw was that the tomb stone had been rolled back. She didn't check to see inside the tomb seemingly, but assumed that the body was gone. Verse two, but now the empty tomb is confirmed to her. And her reaction is, is heartbreaking. In Greek, there are different words to use for someone crying. And Mary's word here as she weeps, it's for those who mourn for the dead. We must picture Mary sobbing, uh, wailing loudly for the death of her Lord Jesus. This poor woman is so overwhelmed by grief, not only was her Lord taken from her and crucified, but even his body has been taken away from her. Her sobbing here is a, is a picture of complete hopelessness. Even her stooping to look inside the tomb just to check again, is it really empty? It's a, it's a sad, sad picture of a terribly sad woman stood weeping. But what else? What does she see? Well, we're told two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. Mark says they looked like young men. Luke says they were dressed in clothes that gleamed like lightning. 
Angels seem to appear at significant points in the earthly life of the Lord Jesus. We're coming up to Christmas time and so we're very aware of the nativity. And so think of Gabriel and how he appeared to Zechariah and to Mary. Or think of the host of angels that appeared in the skies over Bethlehem that night. Don't forget to the angels who came and ministered to the Lord Jesus when he was in the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights fasting and the devil came to tempt him there in that point of weakness. But when Jesus resisted the devil continually afterwards, the angels came and ministered to his needs. Or think in the Garden of Gethsemane where again the Lord is tempted and the Father sends an angel to strengthen the Lord Jesus. Here at his resurrection we again see this connection with heaven. With these two messengers of God sat where Christ's body has lain. Isn't it interesting how John describes where exactly they sat? You know, you'd expect two people to sit side by side, you know, or across from each other, but they're sat at either end of the shelf or the bench where Christ's body had lain, one at the feet and the other at where Christ's head would have been. One commenter de describes it, the place of Jesus' death was between two thieves. The place of his burial was between two angels. But I wonder, can you see another image, another sense of a fulfilment of an old covenant image? Do we see something of what Warren Wearsbury mentions in his commentary of the Ark of the Covenant in that tomb? Two cherubim at either end of an ark on the mercy seat, the place within the Holy of Holies where the high priest would go and sprinkle the blood of sacrifices to make atonement for sin. Do we see here in this empty tomb with this image of two angels? as though this ledge where Christ's body once led speaks of an atonement having been made. Hebrews 9 verse 12, Christ entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Some would have said Mary was so emotional, so grief-stricken, she's only imagining here what she thinks she sees. But then you see these angels interact with her, so this is not an hallucination of sort. They talk to her, they ask her a question, and she gives them back an answer. They ask her, woman, why are you weeping? It's not that they don't know why she's weeping, or it's not that these angelic beings couldn't relate to our human emotion, but their question is just the, the gentlest of rebukes. Why are you weeping, Mary, when today is a day of rejoicing? Why are you crying tears of despair, Mary, when you should be weeping tears of joy? But you see, Mary was misinterpreting the empty tomb. To the angels, the empty tomb meant Christ is risen, therefore rejoice, alleluia, as we sang tonight. But to Mary, the empty tomb meant, as she answers them, verse 13, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've led him. Her words, you see, reveal her expectations. She she believes the Lord Jesus is still dead. That's why she's come back there again. Not to rejoice at an empty tomb, not to sing, as it were, Easter hymns, but she's come back looking to find a dead body somewhere and to rebury it somewhere new, somewhere permanent. That's how much she loved the Lord Jesus, how devoted she was to him, even when she didn't understand things. Mary here illustrates for us someone who, 
who loves the Lord, who genuinely loves him and who genuinely wants to do what they believe to be the right thing for him, but who clearly have a limited, a, a reduced understanding of Christ or who has the wrong expectations of Christ. And so, for example, when they should be rejoicing in a risen Saviour and enjoying his grace towards them, deeply thankful for him having purchased their freedom, having redeemed them from all guilt, from all condemnation, there still stood, as it were, weeping despairingly by an empty tomb, still not realising the blessing of having been adopted into God's family, still not understanding the worth and the the completeness and the security of Calvary for them. This is, this is something that each one of us needs to think through for ourselves as to where it is we're maybe not thinking right about the Lord Jesus and how we are before him now in Christ. Maybe for someone that because of a lack of faith, because of a lack of understanding, but we're weeping, as it were, when heaven wants us to rejoice. We're despairing when we should be delighted. Maybe someone sees their situation as hopeless, when in fact in Christ we have already won. Well, we don't know if Mary saw the angels look beyond her, behind her, but she then becomes aware of someone stood there. And that's our second scene this evening when Mary finally encounters the Lord Jesus herself, for herself rather, verses 14 uh, to 18. She turns and sees a man stood behind her and to begin with she doesn't recognise that it's him, that it's Jesus. A lot of people have tried to explain away why she didn't recognise the one she loved so much and had been looking for so earnestly. Uh, was it the tears in her eyes? Uh, was it still so early that the light wasn't enough for her to see clearly who it was? Or was it simply that as others had experienced, that they were somehow restricted from recognising the resurrected, the, the glorified body of the Lord Jesus? Like in John 21 verse 4 will come to soon, when Jesus stands by the Sea of Galilee and none of his disciples out on the boat are able to recognise him. Or in Mark 16 verse 12 where we read that Jesus appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. Those two were probably the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Verse 14 reads, they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. However it was, however it happened, but to begin with, Mary doesn't recognise the man, stood behind her by the tomb. And because there they are in a, tomb, in a garden, uh, she presumes that he is the gardener. Do you notice the questions that the Lord Jesus asks Mary? His first one's the same as what the angels asked. Woman, why are you weeping? And I think again, it's just a very, very gentle rebuke. But then the one she's looking for asks her, Mary, whom are you seeking? Now, why did Jesus ask her that? Why did he say, who is it you're looking for? Surely it wasn't an act on his part. Surely it wasn't him just playing the part of a gardener, asking her why she was crying and who she was looking for. You see, when the divine asks questions, he already knows the answer to them. Like in Eden, where... God asks Adam, where are you? He knew. Or where he asked Adam and Eve, who, who told you you were naked? He knew. Or did you eat from the tree I told you not to? The Lord knew. 
God knew the answers. But he still asks the questions in order to create a situation, in order to create an opportunity for Adam to, to come out of the darkness, to come out and be humble and confess and repent. Here with Mary in this garden, Jesus is asking her who she's looking for. He knows. But he asks her in order to create an opportunity, in order to prompt her to think and to reflect on who is you, who are you looking for, Mary? What kind of Messiah are you looking for? Are you looking for, in effect, a dead loser? Or are you looking for a risen saviour? Mary's grief, though, was too much for her. She doesn't get the point. She's too upset to figure out this opportunity Christ presents her with. And she asks him, she asks this gardener as she sees him, tell me where you have led him and I will take her away, take him away. Then the gardener calls her by her name. Mary. Now, look closely at the text. Hope you've got your Bible open. Look closely at the text and notice, notice the action that occurs in the text. In verse 14, it says that she turned round, Mary turned and saw the man. Do you see that? But then in verse 16, when the man calls her name, it says this, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher. In other words, Mary had turned away from him before he called her name. She had turned towards him in verse 14, but since she didn't recognize who he was, she turned away again. Now, when I picture that scene in my mind of Mary looking right into the face of Christ, into his eyes, but then turning away. It, it made me think of how many people have for a moment turned towards Christ, as it were, only to turn away again. They heard the gospel or they saw the gospel in someone else and, and with their natural senses, they, they, for a moment, they, they turned towards Jesus. They looked at him only for a moment, only then to look away again when they, in their natural senses, they, they couldn't appreciate the significance of who he is. But then this gardener calls Mary by her name and she turns again. And now, this time, she, she knows who he is. It's the Lord. It's wonderful, isn't it, this picture of turning, turning to Jesus. It's just as Jesus described back in John, uh, John 10. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Was not that what happened for many of us? How many times did we, to some degree, turn towards the Lord Jesus to then, in our ignorance, in our blindness, we turned away again? But then one day, praise God, one day we heard him call us by name. We heard our name in the gospel. We heard that this Jesus died for me, that he died for David Larmer, or he died for whatever your name is. He died for me. And we, we experienced that call from heaven to us, to me, that mysteriously irresistible call of our Savior. And for the first time, we knew it was him, that he was alive. He called us we turn to him and he led us out of darkness, out of despair, to become one of his own. What a happy day that was when in our hearts we heard the Lord call to us by name and by his grace we turned and began to follow him. For Mary, for Mary all her anguish, all her despair is now swallowed up in joy, 
swallowed up in astonishment as she turns and at last realises who it is before her. Rabboni, she says, teacher. And yet she has a lot to learn still of who this teacher is. Look at verse 17 as we close. Look at what the Lord Jesus says to her. Because understandably seeing her Lord in front of her alive, Mary either we presume holds Christ in her hands or in Matthew 28 verse 9 it describes women uh, grabbing Jesus by his feet. Maybe she falls at his feet and grabs his ankles but she appears desperate to not let the Lord Jesus leave her again. So Jesus says to her, do not cling to me Mary for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, as I've studied uh, these verses last week, uh, Don Carson, in his brilliant commentary, he tells us in verse 17, uh, verse 17 is one of the most difficult verses in the whole of the New Testament. Apparently, it's got something to do with the word order in the Greek. Now, I read all that Carson wrote and rather than let on that I understood everything he wrote, I'll just say, we haven't time to look at that this evening, okay? Uh, or take it from me that the ESV translation is good enough for us to get the point. For again, it shows us how, how Mary's understanding of Jesus needs to increase. You see, when she saw the Lord stood in front of her, she wants Jesus to stay with her as he is there, alive. But Christ must yet physically ascend to the Father. Christ must take his seat in glory. Mary wants Jesus, or she wants a Jesus she can keep. She wants a Jesus that she can contain, that she can keep all to herself and limit to herself. But, but Jesus must rise further from the grave. Jesus must be exalted in heaven. And that's how Mary must learn to see the Lord Jesus, how each of us needs to see the Lord Jesus. Not as I, I say this carefully, because I don't want to be disrespectful in this, but we must see Jesus not as a man in a white robe and sandals with a lamb in his arms, but we must see Jesus as an exalted king of all kings, we must see him as he is now, as Christ triumphant, ever reigning. That his is the glory and the crown. His is the high renown, the eternal name, as we sing. So yes, read the gospel. Study what Jesus taught, what he did through his earthly ministry. But also read the prophets. Read Daniel. Read Revelation and see what Christ does this evening as the one before whom all of heaven bows and worships, even before whom John fell as though he had died. When John in Revelation, in the revelation that he was given, when John saw the exalted glory of Jesus Christ, Christ is highly exalted this evening. Christ has been given a name that is high above every other name. And yet, as we close, look at how this exalted King and Saviour relates to each of his own, to those who believe and receive him. Look again at what Jesus tells Mary, verse 17. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Do you see there how the Lord Jesus describes his disciples? My brothers. It reminds us, doesn't it, of how when we came to faith in the Lord Jesus, we became members of God's family. We were adopted into the family of God. We became children of God, sons and daughters of God, where Christ is our saviour and Christ becomes our brother. We share the sonship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christ is our brother this evening. Think of what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 2 verse 11. Both Jesus, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy, the believers, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. The Lord Jesus is our brother this evening. Through faith in him, we have been adopted into the family of God. He is our brother and yet, and yet he will always be more than that, much more than that. For look here how, whilst telling the disciples that they are his brothers, look how still Jesus distinguishes himself from them. I am descending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. It's not our place, you see, to say with the Lord Jesus, our father in heaven, our God in heaven. That's for us to say, but not with him to say. God is his father, his eternal father. That's on a level quite different to us saying that God is now our Father. And this is the tension. This is, as it were, the tightrope that the church has historically tried to walk along, but so often fallen off on either side of. That we either make Jesus out to be so down here, so one of us that he's our mate, as it were, or we make him so up there, so apart from us, he becomes totally unapproachable to us. But this risen king is our brother. He is a friend of sinners. This exalted king still does sympathize with us in our weakness. But let's learn from dear Mary here this evening. Let's not try and control the Lord Jesus. Let's not try and keep down the exalted Lord Jesus, down here where we are, down at our level of understanding, our grasp of things. No, Christ is risen. Christ is now ascended and exalted. And may the Holy Spirit help us to know that, to enjoy that, to benefit from it, and to live accordingly. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's bring this back to God tonight. Lord, thank you for what we have learnt from our sister Mary in how she interacted with the Lord that morning. We thank you, Lord, that Mary went on to understand much more of who her Saviour was. And we pray, Lord, that we would be like that. We would be a growing people a people whose understanding of Jesus is always broadening, always expanding as we are brought to know him more and more. Lord, forgive us when we have reduced Jesus to what we want him to be, how we want him to be, so that we can control him, so to speak. Please forgive us, Lord, and keep bringing us back to Scripture. Keep bringing us back to remind us of who he really is and of how he really is this evening. That he is as John saw him as, that, that person on the throne before whom the elders and all the living creatures bow and worship and praise. Lord, impress that upon us, we pray that we may know Christ as he is more and more and more. Help us, we pray, for we ask in his name. Amen.